A brief history of Japanese punk, hardcore, and record collecting. Please take it away. Just uh, before we start the show, and who is familiar with uh, punk and hardcore? Okay, just a little bit. Not all right. Japanese, but all right, it's all right. So one thing you have to know are uh, punks. They love beers, so <laughs> go ahead, have one. You will get in the mood for that. Uh, so just uh, very quickly as an introduction, uh, I won't be too long about that, but the, the history of punk rock, how it started, everything started in England with, of course, the Sex Pistols and the Clash, Damned, and stuff like that. By the beginning of the 80s, all around Europe, even in Japan, in the US, there were more rough, hardcore kind of music played. And uh, in Japan, they were all influenced by uh, English bands, a little bit more underground, like Discharge, <laughs> thank you, uh, GBH and Chaos UK were the main bands, and of course, Motorhead. Mm -hmm. um, in Japan, uh, in the 78, 79, you started to see uh, the first punk bands like SS or Star Club. Uh, but it wasn't uh, before the 80s, and especially 81, and the first uh, big band started. It was the Stalin. I don't know if you're familiar with them. Uh, I've got here their 82 album called Stop Chop. So the Stalins were uh, very, uh, very provocative, uh, very catchy, very melodic songs too. And uh, yeah, so they were very, very, very popular and very influential for the beginning uh, of the punk scene in Japan. A year later, in 81, there is another band who started. That's the one you like. It's uh, uh, called uh, Gizm. Uh, I don't have any Gizm records because they're all very expensive, so I couldn't afford them. Uh, I've got here one compilation with uh, Gizm on it. So Gizm is very special because they, uh, it's a very special kind of punk with a very metallic guitar and they're kind of avant-garde, uh, industrial influence. So it's very, very, very special, but it started a little bit the hardcore and very more brutal, extreme, and very shocking. Uh, the live performance were kind of uh, happening most of the time, so it was very, uh, very influential. And from there, there are a lot of bands, especially in the Tokyo area, who started uh, the hardcore scene. Uh, most of those bands was very like uh, primitive. I can say, so you have like a drum beat, very binary, a very simple guitar riffs and growling vocals, very shocking names, the sexual, Sodom, LSD, that kind of stuff. So it was very, very uh, aggressive and primitive and also that kind of, uh, yeah, art school, uh, avant-garde kind of touch, so it was very special. Sometimes you didn't know, yeah, what was about. So that was very interesting until the mid 80s, I would say. And uh, in the mid 80s, you started to see some influence from the US mm -hmm. coming, especially from the thrash scene, the metal thrash scene. So something a little bit faster, mm -hmm. shorter. So you had a lot of bands. Uh, I will uh, just give you a couple of names, uh, maybe if you want, uh, maybe like Gaze. Uh, you had also like Systematic Death, SOB. Yeah that you like a lot, I know. So all those bands were playing very fast, a very short song, uh, often affiliated with skateboarding and that kind of stuff, very long hair, back patch on the, on the jeans. So uh, that was during the mid 80s. And during that time, uh, you had a lot of uh, compilation about the record. So a uh, compilation with various artists so you have, for example, one record with four or six bands uh, putting a lot of songs together. Chicken bowels, very good band. Uh, strangely enough, in Japan, we call that an omnibus. <laughs> I don't know why. So it's not a compilation, it's an omnibus. So you have a lot of uh, thrush, punk, hardcore, omnibus that are very famous. Thrush till death, mm -hmm. farewell to arms, Etc. Etc. So most of those bands, as you can see, you have uh, Gaze, as I mentioned, Systematic Death, and one of the most influential uh, for me and for the Japan scene is Lip Cream. 
So Lip Cream, they are a little bit apart from the other bands because they started to add a more guitar work in their hardcore, uh, more melody, if you will. Uh, and that was very interesting. The production was also very different, more tight, more uh, bigger sound. And uh, the other thing that was very different for Lip Cream is that they toured Japan all the time. And they went like in all the places, even the little town where there is a punk saying, hey, I'd like to organize a gig for you in a bar. Okay, we're coming. <laughs> and so they organized most of their tour in summer and they had, I've got some flyers here for you, a very famous tour they organized every year called Bloody Summer. So you had some Bloody Summer, I think from 86 to 89, and they were touring every time, a month and a half, two months, and they were going like everywhere. And so that set the bar very high for a lot of people and for the genre, and it started from there, basically. Uh, and also the other thing, before with all the primitive kind of bands, there were not a lot of substance in the lyrics. Uh, even with the thrash band, it was always drinking, girls, and stuff like that. Lip Cream started to add a little bit more personal stuff, dark stuff. The word is shit, but let's fight, that kind of stuff. It was more personal. And it started the trend for a lot of bands until 89. For me, one of the most important bands uh, is Bastard. And Bastard, very good name, uh, start, uh, released this EP, Controlling the Frame, in 89. And after that, they released uh, an LP, so a big record, the 12 inch. Uh, let me find it here. Da, 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 da. Hold on a second. Here, there you go. Called Wind of Pain. This one is from uh, 92. And this one is the moment everything changed. The production is super tight. The structure is more complex. The guitar work is like over the top. And everything changed from here. After that, you had a lot of uh, bands everywhere in Japan. Maybe not as tight and overproduced than that, but everywhere, even the small places like Tottori, Shizuoka, Kita Kyushu, Shimonoseki, everywhere, and playing that kind of very galloping drum, super riff, uh, gang vocals, that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, it started from there, and it was kind of a tsunami, forgive me the expression. <laughs> so it was really like everywhere yeah. from the mid-90s to the end of the 90s. Uh, from there, it started to go low a little bit like this, uh, mainly because of uh, a lot of people died. Uh, there were a lot of drug use in the scene. Uh, also, not as many young people were coming into the scene, so only the old folks uh, were still playing. It's still, like uh, <laughs> it's still the same to them. I mean, there are still some bands, like they are 50, 60 years old, are still playing <laughs> the same bands, the same song. So it started to decline a little bit from there. Uh, there were still uh, a couple of bands here and there. Uh, one of my favorite, uh, oddly enough, is from Fukuoka, uh, and is called uh, Nemesis. I have here some of their records. They are two seven inches like it. Uh, yeah, pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. So yeah, Nemesis, they were very like young kids. They were like 20 something. Uh, shameless plug, I released those records with my label at the time. Hey. They were friends and it was uh, super tight. Uh, the other reason I think, and it's just a theory, uh, about the decline of the punk out coursing, during the 80s and the 90s, most of the people playing that kind of music were like uh, Chimpira, Yankee, <laughs> uh, some very low class uh, thugs, construction oh. workers, so people who are very struggling mm -hmm. and they really embrace the punk way of life. Uh, yeah, you know, like in you. Yeah, so like in Europe, a lot of people are like, yeah, punk, like fuck the system, whatever, but still they have their daily job, <laughs> you know, they're watching Netflix or whatever. Here in Japan, like they already embrace that and they are like, yeah, we are not playing this game. And it, they are in survival mode, basically. And since the 2000, whatever, the life quality in Japan like got better mm -hmm. and most of the people playing the young punks like they have a job in a company, they are like programmer or stuff like that. And the weekend they are playing a band and that's all. They are not really like from the street 
and, uh, and that's why it declined a little bit. But with the inflation, maybe we'll see a comeback <laughs> from the Japanese pound kaka. Who knows? Um, so <laughs> so uh, that's a little bit about the history. I'm sorry I did very quick because there are so many things to say. Now just a couple of things about the records themselves. I talked a little bit about the compilations, the omnibus. Uh, there was something very interesting in Japan. Uh, I will just show you here from the Stalin LP in a bonus gift. There is a little record that we call the flexi, a flexi record. Uh, in Japan, it has the sweet name of Sonoshit. Yes. Yes, indeed. So it's the, <laughs> it's the sheet, the, like the sheet of paper that you can list. I think it's a very cute name. That's a sono sheet. Yeah. So uh, the thing you have to know about that, it's, as it's very thin, you are using less material, so it's cheaper to produce. So most of the bands during the 80s, when they produced their first record, they did a sono sheet. <laughs> and some of the bigger bands, they were putting that as a bonus uh, yeah. in their LP. So there were a huge market. The main company producing the Sono Sheet were in Japan. So that's why you had that everywhere. And it closed during the 90s, I think. So that's why you don't see them anymore. Um, now, there is a huge, huge market about the Japanese punk hardcore records, even more since the last 10 years. A lot of uh, foreigners are coming in Japan, digging records and selling them on Discogs, for example. So uh, I think one of the most expensive record uh, I saw uh, is this one. It's not an original one. This one is a bootleg. So this one is a flexi originally. It's called uh, it's, uh, the first uh, flexi from Execute. I think the last time I saw it in Tokyo in a record shop, it was uh, 300,000 yen. <laughs> yeah. Wait, yeah. It's a flexi. It's a, fle it's a flexi. Yes, and German. So this one is just a bootleg released a couple years ago. It's like five bucks. It's, yeah, that's it. uh, the thing you have to know just very quickly about the flexes, uh, they, are very th they are very thin, so they sound like shit. And when you put them on the turntable, they skip all the time. So it's, it's useless. I sold, I sold most of my flexes. I realized I could get a lot of money, and they were just like big coasters for the beer. So <laughs> just, like, they were not very useful. So I sold most of them. Yeah, uh, yeah that's it. Yeah, they are very, very collectible. Uh, a lot of people are still looking. There were, I think, like just they were when they were released, there were like a thousand yeah. press that sold like thousand, two thousand. Uh, rarely represses at that time. So yeah. Were they made by the same materials as General LP? Yeah, yeah, it's the same. Okay. It's the same is just thinner <laughs> and less less material. Mm. So I, I did not touch them then. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, but I think I'm all, I'm almost done. I suppose just very quickly talk a little bit about that. I have no idea. Okay, there you go. Uh, just very quickly, uh, yeah, talk about a bit not geography, but yeah, there were uh, as I said. A lot of cities, small city, where a lot of bands were playing. And at that time, going back to the omnibus, uh, there were a lot of uh, compilation or omnibus dedicated to the city. Mm -hmm. So you have, for example, Mie City mm -hmm. Hardcore Compilation, Kyoto City Hardcore Compilation. You have a lot of stuff like that. Uh, what is the, the next one? Oita? City Hardcore. Yeah, so you have a lot of stuff like that all the time. Uh, you have a, a nice scene uh, in Kyushu, uh, a very small band. Uh, my favorite was well, I, for example. They are still playing today. In Fukuoka, there were a very like noisy, uh, primitive band called Confuse. Mm -hmm. Same, I sold their flexi because they are unlistenable. Um, and yeah, so Kyushu was very interesting. One of my favorites I will share with you is this one, Bandit. So it's, uh, I think this one is from uh, 91. It was a CD only released. Mm -hmm. A quick note, there is a lot, a lot of CD only released mm -hmm. in Japanese punk mm -hmm. hardcore. And a lot of record collectors, they are kind of like uh, looking at that, it's CD, that's not good. But they are amazing. So yeah, people usually, the, the true hardcore fan there buy the CDs. So this one was a CD only release. I released the uh, record version also with my label because that's one of my favorite one. 
And uh, a very uh, quick note here, the last one, I would say, uh, in the 80s, there were very nice band from Shimonoseki, but that was often affiliated with uh, the Kyushu scene because they were playing in Kokura and because there is nothing else in Shimonoseki. <laughs> um, yeah, working class. Yeah. Shimonoseki and, it, working and this class. band was called Kuro here. Uh, if you uh, know your Japanese, you can see that there's the kanji the for Shiro, indeed. Ironic. So, ironic. ironic. And the reason is, uh, so you have the kanji Shiro, but they are reading it Kuro, because as they were saying, Shiro demo, Kuro demo, ore wa tachi ya Kuro. So, <laughs> even white, even black, we are black. Like, they were really like true punk. That's why they were using the white kanji to say black. And they were really, really, really aggressive. Uh, the live performance were always like big fight, people giving the middle finger <laughs> and fighting each other. The scene in the 80s were really, really violent. Less in the 90s, but there were probably more drugs. Kind of the same. Depends on the drugs, though. Depends on the drugs. Yeah, yeah. So, so fun fact, uh, <laughs> talking about drugs. So uh, Japanese punks uh, use speed as uh, the drug of choice, but they inject. Yeah, speed, so it's super hardcore. Yeah, yeah, it's it's totally uh, hardcore. So that's why a lot of them died, yeah. and uh, yeah, that's it. So um, I don't. I'm sorry. I tried to do very mm -hmm. quick. There would be so many, so many things to say about, about the yeah, scene, yeah. about the different bands because there are big bands, there are smaller bands, uh, all the dress codes, uh, the fact that a lot of uh, punks shave their eyebrows for some reasons <laughs> to look tougher. That there are so many things to say, a funny anecdotes about the tools, about how the records are made, uh, about people also doing some artworks for the flyers. There is some punk uh, designer or punk drawer. So it's very interesting. There are so many things to say, but I have a time limit, and I don't want to bother you too much about uh, <laughs> something uh, like this. But uh, if you have any question, please uh, go ahead. I will do my best uh, to answer it. So I'm an old guy, and I don't know what is good and what is bad about punk rock. So for us, we don't know at all um, punk rock. Then it sounds like a noise. Or <laughs> <laughs> it is. Only noise. <laughs> yeah. So how do you evaluate the greatness or the creativity of the punk rock? Drugs, good noise and bad noise. Drugs is also very, uh, very important. Now to to take some uh, to take some information from the last speaker about the YouTube videos, I would say talent and passion. Yeah. A lot of those yeah. bands also a lot yeah. of passion. They put their guts uh, out. Yeah, the passion comes out. Yeah. Do you reckon the drugs and alcohol amplify the passion and kind of creativity and all that? Creativity, yes, I think. Yes. Yeah. I mean, like it's not only about punk rock. I mean, look at Keith Richards. Yeah. I mean, like. Uh, Takara has been using drug for like 60 years. Really and Nelson, look at, really I mean, like, um, yeah. But yeah, I think all, yeah. passion is very important. Like I saw some punk bands in the US and in Europe yeah. when they play like some small gigs with 10 people, they are kind of, ah, oh, there's only 10 people. Yeah, right. but, but can you describe how passion makes the real sound or the, how we, the other person, the, the listeners feel about passion? I think it's very personal, I think. I think it's very personal. You can be reactive or not, but like if you see, if you see it, you understand it. I think if you see a band playing his guts out with a lot of passion, you're like, wow. You, know, like, you can see it's not just like a gimmick they are playing. Even if it's noise, you can see that a lot of things are going through. A lot of the best punk music also grew in development together with other genres. So like if you look at the early punk scene, Susie and the Banshees, like they played, like a lot of the early punk bands became bands that, like U2 for example, if you think U2 today, they play very, like, they're friendly music. But they were influenced by bands like Joy Division, who were influenced by other, you know, so the whole genetics of punk music and that kind of music goes very far. So even to today, you see the so, material. And so, yeah, as I, wa as I was saying also, like most of the people playing punk, like, yeah, they were like a chimpila or very low class. Most of those people, they come from broken family with alcoholism. They are broken people. Most of them, they are broken people. And people going to see those shows, 
they are also like they don't fit anywhere and it's like a place where they can be themselves with other people like themselves and the sound even if it's noise to most of the people it's like okay we are the same i understand you and like so that's also very important like punk was that too it's like a place for people who don't fit. So it sounds like a, what sound did, did they make is not only important, but also how they make sound is very important. The heart. Yeah. The heart. And most of the people in Japanese alcohol often talk about the heart. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A lot, a lot, a lot. Yes, sir. A uh, question just about the venues. Yeah. Right? Because they, they were playing in venues. Are some of these venues still around? Because I know a lot of the bands aren't really around anymore, but are, because... Yes. I, I, some, sorry, some, yeah. yeah. Some of them are still around, yeah. Like in, uh, in Kitakushu Kurosaki, you had like Marcos. Like during the 90s in Marcos, you had Lip Cream, Bastard playing there. It's still there. It's still there. Um, I have a flyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So here you have a, a gig for Gaze and Kuro in Kokura in and out so that was the venue so the venue is still there it's just the, the name changed it became Bagus, and then it changed and now it's fused but it's the same place they still play live music. yeah they're still playing live music. Here. yeah okay. yeah sure go ahead what's your most valuable or prized collectible you have in your ownership uh, you mean like uh, yeah, the emotional yeah like the <laughs> money uh, money wise but most valuable maybe both if you can ask both yeah. Give us both, yeah. I don't know. I think money, money wise, I sold them already. <laughs> so, I mean, like, uh, but they were. Being a father, being a father. Being a father, sell. I had, I had <laughs> to. Um, I think the the Kuro record are very uh, dear, dear in my heart. Uh, and I would say, like, the Bastard LP I saw you is not that expensive now because it has been repressed, uh, I think, like 10 years ago. Uh, so, it it's widely distributed, but the original one is still kind of expensive, but it's such an amazing record. And of course, all the Lip Cream records for me are like... Do you think they're going to increase in value over time? Same record all finite game. items will. <laughs> if it's finite, yeah, it's if, finite, if it's yeah. finite it, it will increase in value, pretty much. I think especially now that the, there is a huge vinyl market, and even for the new items, the prices are super high. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, it's increased, and with the inflation, if you go now to a record store to dig for some second-hand records, the thing you got for like a 10,000 yen before, it's, it's double. So the prices are so high, meaning that so many people want it. So a lot of people want it, and it was very uh, low production. production. So there were like only a thousand pressed, and so many people wanted that it's, yeah. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the, you know, with the growing uh, with the record market, but then about CDs. Also. Yeah. The, how has, you know, you, you're showing um, records uh, today. How has the CD market, uh, how did the CD market grow in, during this time, you know, 80s and 90s? Because, you know, CDs get pressed, yeah. what, like? Early 90s. Early 90s, yeah. Right? So, 80s, none, so there were no influence about that. When it started pressing CD, the vinyl production just declined and just stopped for a while. Just a couple of seven inches, the, the smaller format, like this. But that's all. I thought it was just CDs all the way. And early, early 2000, started to see a uh, growth yeah. again, uh, especially because there were more, uh, Japan was more open uh, to like, the US and the European market, and people there don't buy CDs, they buy records, so they were like trying to adapt a little bit to the market. But there are still a lot of CDs still produced now in all Asia. The Asian market for CDs are huge. And tapes. Mm. Oh, oh cassette. cassette tapes, yeah. Cassette yeah, that's tapes. what I was going to was gonna, Cassette, the, in the early hardcore scene, was cassette made, yeah. taping a lot? Yeah. Okay. So basically, they were just taping themselves. <laughs> and uh, yeah. just, yeah, like they were dubbing their tapes and giving sorry, that at man, shows just... and that sort. And those are very, very oh. rare yeah, collectible right. items. Cassettes are so, Yeah, so I mean, like Bandit that I show you, their first demo tape was like 30 copies. 
they were giving away at their first That's how you traded your music, yeah. And, uh, and so people are looking for the 30, yeah. 30 yeah, exactly. tapes. So people are still looking for that. And so there are people now trying to dig that and repress that on vinyl. So, yeah. you know, like back in the day before you had music that was like easily exchanged like you have like bands send their cassette tapes in the mail to like, the USA with yeah. yeah. like another band and they would write letters so that tape trading was a but Japan was very isolated oh, really? they were yeah. not okay. so much going abroad maybe the bigger bands in the 80s uh, because there were um, an, an American guy called Pursed he's a drawer I don't know if you know Pursed uh, he has a band uh, Septic Death and a label called Postmort, and he was releasing some stuff. He released the Farewell to Arms compilation. So that was the only bridge to the US, was this guy. But apart from that, uh, very isolated. Japan is Before the internet, did they tour internationally, or was it only Japan? It's only Japan. Oh, SOB had a European tour in Nepal, definitely. Yeah, uh, Gaze did one tour in the UK in the 90s. They hated it, and they, yeah. and they said we'll never go back abroad. Really? Uh, and I think in the 2000s, there were a lot of reunions, and people were calling them to tour in Europe. So from there, a lot of bands were touring, but 80s, 90s. Nothing, yeah. Japan, just Japan. 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 Downloaded online, kind of stuff. The, how, how has that market changed? Has that market changed? Has it grown? Is it? I mean, I can imagine you cannot find some music by uh, groups yeah. unless you buy a CD. Especially like uh, Japanese punks, especially the old school one. They are very, uh, very hard to deal with that. Like there were some bootleg made, and like for them it was kind of a yeah, a stab in the back. Sacrilege. Yeah, and like there were plans, like for example, we had plans to tour the US, but someone did the bootleg, so we cancel everything. Yeah. You stabbed us in the back. Yeah. Like uh, making an illegal download is like, no fucking way about yeah. that. So they are very, very, it's very hard. Maybe the younger generation is more about like social media and that kind of stuff. But as I said, the really Japanese punk hardcore scene, there's not so much of a new generation, so. But yeah, the new generation, musically speaking, they are more open to the digital. Mm -hmm. Yeah, of course. But yeah, before that, not at all. So like, if you want to go digging for these records, there are places in Japan, like, I'm a tenant house DJ, so I go hard off there anywhere like yeah. that, and I find those kinds of records. Will you find this kind of stuff there? Or yeah, so I like, yeah, so. I get hard off and stuff. In hard off, that kind of stuff, it's very, it's very difficult. Um, no, even that, you have to go to a specialized record store, yeah, like in right. punk, metal, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Yeah. Most of them closed. Uh, there were one in Fukuoka, like 10 years ago, it closed. Most of them now in Tokyo, but they are struggling because of the inflation, the prices. And because in Tokyo, there is a used, um, a used record chain called Disc Union. You've heard about it? <laughs> they are huge, and basically, they, they took everything. And if you want to get some second-hand records, <coughs> it's Disc Union, and that's all. Okay. And, uh, and the prices now are very high. You can find some stuff on Yahoo Auction a little bit, oh, that's but that's all. Yeah. yeah, so now the record digging is more and more difficult. So I do a group of Japanese who share the same view as you. Sorry, one more time. So, are there any Japanese group of people who share the same view about this? Yeah, I mean, the, the Japanese people are into punk rock. Yeah, sure. They are less and less, but... Uh, <laughs> less and less, or they are getting more old, but... Uh, yeah. Dying out. Yeah, they're dying out. There is? Okay, yeah. Uh, this is the yeah. Okay, I think we got enough for one more question. Okay. Yeah. And the music! Yeah, I will play, I'll play <laughs> some of the records right. from now. But I think uh, we're coming up on time and we gotta play some music uh, going on now. Yeah. So, um, everybody, please give another um, round of applause to Mark. Yeah. 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 Yeah.